for the last of the whole time. Kitty, let us know. Uh, I'll just start. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. We are live. We can start. Okay. Uh, so, welcome everyone uh, to the annual Sea Research Symposium. Um, this so every year since 2017, Sea has been inviting uh, several uh, researchers who are typically young graduates to the school to participate in in some of the ongoing uh, studies and research uh, at the school. So usually. Uh, the researchers spend about a year, a year's time, or two semesters' time with us, um, and and help us, you know, help us uh, to develop the, you know, the research streams further. Just to give you a brief background uh, about C Studio, uh, C Studio is conceived as a research center focused on undertaking research on architecture, environment, urbanism, and other allied disciplines. It aims at generating new knowledge on habitats across the context of the global south. The, cur the current projects are uh, housing and urbanization, repair and retrofitting, environment and landscape, post-intensive landscapes, South Asian architecture and urbanism, and emerging materiality. Um, today, we will be seeing the presentations from three of the above mentioned clusters. Uh, Post-intensive landscape present will, will be presented by Vastavik Bhagat and followed by environment and landscape by Rohit Muzumdar, Vastavik and Shreya Kothavle, and lastly repair and retrofit by Prasad Shetty and Komal Gopwani. I'll just give a brief uh, introduction to all the speakers. We have Nikhil Anand, uh, who is a discussant, um, you know, for for uh, for today's panel. Um, Nick, just uh, if you can give me a minute. Right. Yeah. Um, Nikhil is an environmental anthropologist uh, whose research focuses on cities, infrastructure, state, state power, and climate change. He is an associate professor of anthropology at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, today's presenters, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Vastavikta Bhagat, uh, Rohit Muzumdar, uh, Shreya Kothavle, uh, Prasad Chetty, and Komal Gopani. I'll just introduce them very briefly. Uh, Vastavikta is an architect focusing on the spatial and environmental politics surrounding post intensive mining landscapes and climate change in Indian cities. She is currently researching a wide range of household experiences and responses to wetness in suburban Mumbai. Drawing on a year-long research associateship at sea uh, in 2000, between 2018 and 2020. She is concurrently developing a graphic novel and journal article manuscript on the conversations surrounding the futures of Goa's mining landscapes. She was a field, um, she was a field stations 2019 fellow under the Wright Ingram Institute in Columbia and has worked earlier with Anupama Kundu Architects, Ratan Bartlibai, uh, Bartlibai Consultants, Krivia's Design Cell, and uh, Ranjit Singh Architects. We have uh, Rohit Muzumdar, um, who is an architect and a planner whose research on cities focuses at the intersections of e economic networks, difference, law, communicative and collaborative action, and storytelling. He is currently researching the spatial and environmental politics of a refuge, refugee city in Mumbai's periphery based on copy culture economics, ec economies, and emerging context of urbanization and housing in eight second cities across South India. His, early, his earlier research has focused on the spatial and cultural politics of collaborative action in establishing special economic zone in Maharashtra. As a part of the Inhabited Seas project, uh, he is studying a wide range of household experiences and responses to wetness in suburban Mumbai. Shreya is an architect uh, whose research interests lie in gender studies and the role of architecture in conflict zones. She is currently researching a wide range of household experiencing uh, and sorry, a wide range of household experiences and responses to wetness in suburban Mumbai. She has been invited by the UN uh, Habitat to present her design proposal to build public sanitation infrastructure for trans communities and by the Encore Foundation for Water for the Informals in Mumbai. 
she recently presented a paper at the gender and academic leadership in architecture in, in india symposium uh, she has worked with mashal a design uh, mashal to design a rehabilitation project at a disaster prone site in pune um, we have prasad shetty uh, who is an urbanist uh, based in mumbai he has studied architecture uh, from kamla raja institute of architecture in mumbai followed by uh, an urban management course uh, at institute of institute for housing and Ur urban development studies in rotterdam he is one of the founder members of the uh, school of environment and architecture and currently works at the school as a professor and dean he is also the he is also one of the founding members of collective research initiative trust urban research collective which has been involved in urban research activities in the city of mumbai earlier he has worked with mmrda which is the mumbai metropolitan region development authority uh, mmr's heritage and uh, environment society academy of architecture and kamla raja institute of architecture finally we have komal komal gopwani uh, komal is an architect with a keen interest in theory history and architecture in, in the public realm she was an integral part of the anganwadi project at andabad between 2012 and 2014 that work with community participation to build preschool in the neighborhood komal has graduated from shrimati madaruma bai mundle college of architecture in from nagpur uh, she was awarded the best graduating student award for the 2011 batch she has completed a post graduation from sept university in theory and design in 2013 her master's thesis discussion uh, discussing the societal role of architecture was published in by the sept university press as a monograph titled architectural expressions people time ideologies following a masters she completed a month long portfolio a portfolio advancement course at the siena institute of art in italy in a five years of professional work experience komal has worked as an architect with art architects and the bad as an associate and senior asso associate at rma uh, rma architects in mumbai so welcome everyone a uh, long list of uh, panelists today um just one small request before i hand it over to vastavikta to uh, start a presentation i would request all the other panelists to turn off their videos uh, until uh, you know we, we reach the end of the presentation so that only the presenter's video can be seen on the youtube live Uh, and for those who are uh, listening on zoom as well as on youtube uh, the session is recorded live and will also be streamed live on youtube simultaneously yeah vastavikta over to you thank you is my screen visible uh, yes yes okay so i'll begin uh, uh good evening today i will be presenting my paper futures present uh, the new natures of sonchi's uh, post extractive landscapes under the post intensive landscapes cluster uh, this paper is written based on the field work which is carried out under the sea research associateship program of uh, 2018 2019 Uh, this was done through talking to several local actors uh, collecting archival documents and intensively sketching on site uh, through this i began piecing small stories together and i will be using this some working sketches that i've uh, used in my graphic novel uh, made then along with the storytelling as a method to discuss my paper uh, my first story helps me uh, set up a problem statement about what happens when two big cats squabble to reshape the mining territory a uh, paulo has tirelessly toiled to revive his paddy farms he is worried about the future of his hamlet my hamlet is cocooned within the martian water filled uh, craters and new blue tarpaulin mountains most of, most of the year have lost their income because of the mining ban he lives in the madliawado which is a small wadi in uh, uh, in the hamlet of sonshi and he represents the adivasi gauda community known for their prowess in cultivating shared khazan fields a uh, tractor another resident lives in the khalsiawado and uh, represents the migrants who after the 1940s uh, settled in sonshi from and came from states across india and worked tenaciously as truck drivers or uh, manual laborers 
uh, Bhattar, another actor, forbids Kavlo to enter and cultivate his farms and orchards. Uh, Bhatka lives in the Varsiavado and represents Goa's Desai community of Konkana, uh, Konkani Maratha moneylenders, who were introduced by the Portuguese rule as land administrators. Uh, this relegated uh, the Gavras as mere land tenants. Uh, Kavlo mumbles. His threatening vigil of asbestos barricades reminds me of two big elusive cats who constantly keep on fighting. Company, one of the big cats, uh, wants to continue mining in this village. While the new Nilgiris planted by Sarkar remind him of, uh, by, the, by the new Nilgiris remind him of Sarkar, who hopes to use afforestation to turn the mining landscape to its pristine condition. On his stroll to campus in Saiti, as he walks through the village commons, he wonders, what does the future hold for us? Here, his senses open to unusual sights, as he spots the long-tailed devil, the langur. Towards the mining pit, he hears the sharp-toothed mugger feasting on ro rohu and katla fish. He exclaims, when did this change take place? He realizes that several non-human species, the small fish, quietly took over the woods, while the big cats squabbled to reshape the hilly mining territory. This vignette of a non-human takeover is situated in Sonshir, uh, a hamlet of Isilam village located in the mining belt of North Goa. What we see as the cross marks are all the mines that are there in the current state of Goa. Uh, in, within the hamlet, it consists of 65 households and out of the 550 hectares of hamlet land, uh, 500 hectares is mines. Uh, the Supreme Court passed an order in 2012 in judgment of a civil society led with petition filed in the backdrop of the Shark Commission report of 2005-2010 that resulted in the banning of all the mining activities in the region. Again in 2018, no new leases were renewed in mines where environmental regulations were flouted. Uh, Kaido, another actor, represents the hand of the law responsible for this re-regulation. All these actors perceive the situation arising out of the mining ban uh, as stagnant, impasse, or a fracture to society. However, this quite non-human takeover of Sonshi's landscape in the face of its perceived impasse uh, opens out a curious puzzle for me. Therefore, I ask, how do competing imaginations of the future of post-extractor mining landscapes at Sonshi Goa shape their present? Uh, the, the debate within which my question is, is embedded in is focused on three aspects. First is the problem of definition. Uh, in current definitions of landscapes of resource extraction, there is a rush to the post. Uh, these definitions have emerged mainly from the Euro-American experience. Uh, uh, I see this as a teleological problem where such clear linear transitions do not exist in the Indian context. Uh, the second concern is an interpretive problem of wastelands, where the, pro where the futures here are seen as an impasse. Uh, this is because the textual and visual representations are always uh, limited to wounds, scars, voids, and uh, unwanted grime on the environment or ecosystem. Here, there is a methodological problem in understanding the natural habitats that negate the epistemological and cultural differences of communities. By this, I mean there is a need to reread the fractures to engage with the relationality of communities in the surrounding areas and go beyond the metaphors of impasses. Uh, the third concern about Sonshi, uh, in thinking about Sonshi is the language in which its future is conceptualized. Uh, the strategies that come to address uh, it, uh, such as restoration, rehabilitation, and remediation, get limited to culturally providing uh, heritage museums, commercial districts, or green gardens of tourism. Uh, these interventions, however, fracture the complex claims that are made by communities on land, environment, and thus the futures. Therefore, uh, I ask, what are the provocations beyond the sketch of extreme ends of a future, which is that of a dystopian future of a wasteland uh, resulting from intensive resource extraction on the one hand, and a utopian future of ecological restoration of pristine nature on the other hand? And by questioning this, I ask, who is the architect? And then what does the architect do? Uh, my inquiry here has a broader purchase because many landscapes of 100 to 1,200 hectares contiguous in nature, such as Sonshi with public and private sector undertakings, are located across diverse geographies in India. They collectively uh, are within agrarian hinterlands, within forests, uh, rivers, or the new corridors of urbanization. Uh, according to activists, there, there is also a lot of protest movements that have emerged in response that are associated with these uh, landscapes, which present uh, common conflicts around uh, confused land ownerships, grabs, and displacement, and even degradation of environmental life. Uh, your opening up Sonshi's case might provide insight into studying its counterparts beyond their conceptualizations of wastelands. Uh, the, the other four stories that I will be narrating are around ecological restoration, the privatization of village commons through greening, 
uh, the diverse futures of indigenous communities and the stories of scavenge. Uh, the first story that helps me uh, open up this is about the shape-shifting forest being Sateri. Uh, uh, she has come to visit the French Chenedi, a sacred tree in, that, in what remains of the balding Devrai. In her present state, she is visible in the form of a wet dampness in the soil. Today, they witness an unusual sight. Uh, in the past, the two, the two lived and nurtured each other here when the Devrai was lush and filled with spectacular non-human life forms. Well, today, Kavlo has uh, returned to here after three decades with his clan, in a Jatra, and has come to pluck the Kegri flower that has finally bloomed. Uh, the turning of the red bowl carried out by a company that uh, filled their stomachs with Sateri's blessing has stopped, uh, with Sarkar's blessing has stopped for more than a decade. Today, he has come, today, Kavlo has come over here to reinvoke the blessings of the spring for a favorable, prosperous future. With his return, Chanadi here says, are these the winds of change that might be blowing in the favor of a Devrai? Uh, but Kaulis clan isn't the only actor that has been visiting the Devrai. Uh, after Kaida stopped the churning of the red gold, when Kaulo cried for justice when his wealth ran dry, Toti Sarkar has been frequenting uh, the forest in search for old springs uh, and wells. Uh, they may have dried up due to the churning. That may have dried, dried up due to the churning. Uh, Sarkar and company also come to plant uh, foreign fast-growing trees. All of these... Uh, Acts, however, are seen by a, dist uh, a distrustful Kavlo, as uh, are seen with distrust by Kavlo. Uh, Sateri realizes that Kavlo's clan is here to revive their cultural association with the spring and the Devrai. She asks, do they believe that the spirits of the forest never left from the Devrai and thus come here today? Still distrustful regarding the future of the Devrai, uh, she asks, will the splinters of her woods blow in the winds of these change? But distrust stems from the fact that each time company, Sarkar, Bhattar, Kavlo, and Truckers clan came together, they cruelly plotted to transform the Devrai through churning of red gold from the bellies of the hills. The last time this happened, the entire atmosphere of the hamlet changed for nearly five decades, with red dust coating the woods, the skies, and even their homes. She wonders, what are their intentions this time around? Sateri then changed the form and was reduced to a thin red channel not wider than Kavlo's arm. Chanadi though skillfully asks, why do you worry, Sateri? You are a shapeshifter and have the power to reinvent yourself. You can hide, dodge, and forge new paths. Is your disappearance from the Devrai not linked to your re reappearance elsewhere? What burden do you then carry, Sateri? Still doubtful of the Devrai's revival through these actors, including Kalu, Chanadi reminds Sateri of the time even before the turning began, when Pagali captured the forest and Hamlet Indians to earn foro from uh, inland traders. He installed Bhatkar to collect the foro from Kaulo's woods as well. When Kaulo was unable to pay, Bhatkar paid it to Pakale in exchange for the complete possession of Kaulo's land. Both Bhatkar and uh, Pakale enjoyed the bounty of the soil. Uh, Pakale here, let me mention, is the colonial state. Uh, as his greed grew, he got his cronies to make a map of the treasure that lay beneath the land. And on discovering red gold, called company to dig into the earth's bellies. Paolo is compelled to compete with Trucker's clan, who too had started arriving around this time in the hamlet to earn better wages. Sateri remembers, Pakali worshipped the cross in the church and never saw any sacred value in the spirits of the Devrai, and therefore permitted company to plunder a sacred home. While neither did Bhattar nor, and nor Trucker have anything to do with us, as we slipped into an abyss of collective memory. This probing has absolved Pablo of the sole responsibility of banishing Sateri. And fond memories of the time even before Pakale or Kablo arrived in Seoul, she flashed through her mind. Uh, in, in her past, she was an uninterrupted gurgling presence uh, 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 going through the wildest woods and tallest streets. Uh, however, when Kablo's clan later came, they uh, extended their home from the hills to the Mandovi River itself. Orchids were grown on the highest slopes where the bark used to roam freely, and the lower slope was uh, where. Uh, Kavlo's clan toiled to drain, uh, the for, drain for the fields. They also engineered Sateri into their farms. Uh, the Gaukaris that then governed the hamlet uh, considered the place where Sateri sprung from as sacred and therefore prohibited activities like bathing, drawing water, or even cutting trees in the, in the forest. Uh, after this back and forth, Chanadi wonders aloud. If Kavlo's clan has been responsible for transforming this landscape to such an extent, before the other four actors even came in and engineer your movement, what burden necessitates you to, to return to your purest form of Paolo's memory? To this, Sateri responds with self-doubt. 
this time i hope that the conversation around the conservation of a devra is different maybe this time they see me beyond my physical form and kavlas clan has a different story to tell uh, satiri is uh, satiri is in the only mystical spirit uh, trading kavlas hamlet presently uh, ravan dev another grammar dev is here to play the devil's advocate to kavlas clan uh, my bhatkar has called for them to meet at the hall of ravan dev's temple uh bhatkar stares out at the hamlet from a distance the clan would have not remained so unproductive if kavlas clan would have stopped complaining to choti sarkar for clean water and air and the ancestral lands he is the sarpanch of this hamlet and has arrived with a new proposition crafted in with company's connivance as he enters the large hall elder silences the crowds aiming to entice the clans he announces with a white smile many of you must have already heard that a company has turned the barren and lifeless craters and mounds of dust that are similar to a hamlet in the nearby town into eden the elaborate description of this eden translates into pristine garden of nature where there are butterfly and bird parks species culture farms medicinal parks herb gardens and bamboo plantation where the occasional tourist treads in he continues i come to ask you for your blessings to make this project successful in a hamlet In return for this gift, company and I will also build a hospital for you, so that no one has to travel far off. Village elders still detest Bhatkar, but cheerfully reciprocate by asking for some time to deliberate. After he leaves, conversation breaks down within smaller groups. Both the clans are unable to fully comprehend the implication of the wonderful dream that has just been sold to them. A troubled Kavlo is lost in his thought. He asks, "When the churning of the red coal stopped, Bhatkar and company?" Instru- uh, Bhatkar and Company's instructions immediately shut the clinic. Why the sudden change of heart and generousness? Uh, Ravan Dev, who was listening to Sarpanch's uh, the Sarpanch's speech, uh, and Kavla senses his fo- faint footsteps and thus shouts, "Who's there? You've come to my home!" And here he voice responds. Kavla is now aware of Ravan Dev's presence, who, on introducing himself, asks with a wider grin, "Tell me, how did the idea of health in your hamlet change from what it was before?" when did you start believing that uh, a hospital will better the health of your hamlet as they stare at the blue mounds of dust that cast a shadow on the temple kalu uh, kalu uh, continues there was a time when these mounds were exposed a strong gust of wind and a heavy downpour used to carry fine dust that coated our homes and poisoned our rivers it choked our wind pipes and deflated our lungs when my people coughed endlessly company and bhatkar built for us a clinic to show their goodwill With the change of the form of work, our diseases changed, and so did our reliance on these new ways. But we were tired and perplexed as the new, as the red dust continued to persist. We decided to take matters into our own hand and turned turn to its Choti Sarkar to help us get back the lands. During our collective plea, Kaido passed a rule such that company had to stop the churning of the red coal. Choti Sarkar therefore had to find a way to heal the wounds of the open belly of the earth. Hatkar and company latched onto it so as to find a new way of making fortunes from our lands. So this is how the demand for clean air and green environments was manufactured in our hamlet. But we just want to churn out red gold to suffice our needs and also reduce the dust in the air so that we can finally breathe. Uh, both now walk towards the remains of the hills on top of which was once Ravan Dev's home. Ravan Dev asks, uh, "But what is your past ways to maintain the good health of your clan?" Uh, Ravan Dev here is trying to probe Kalu about the time when the health of the hamlet wasn't related to the physical health, but uh, included a major role uh, that the commons played over here. Uh, the hamlet of Ravan Dev's old home was completely different from uh, how it stands today. When the air and water was devoid of red dust, the only worries that plagued the clan uh, was the failed crops and being smited by evil demon spirits and the displeased devas. Uh, during this time, the hamlet revi- uh, relied on you, O Deva. Kalu says. Your home was at the edge of a hamlet. Do not allow evil spirits to enter our lands. The guru who stayed to look after your stone shrine and cut its strange uh, space and syrups with from wild plants. Ravan Dev further adds, "Yes, I used to patrol along the hamlet's edge. What your belief in me kept most illicit at bay. But little did we know that this wasn't your to stay." Paulo looks out over at Ravan Dev, who smirks back at him. Don't you remember the bhatkar swoop that changed it all? Kalu remembers when he came in. He convinced us to place you into a new home closer to closer to our Vado. Hatkar constructed a temple that was lavish and grand. Weren't you happy with the beautiful home, Adeva? Ravan Dev replies. When did you start believing in caging your gods, dear friend? Caged and helpless, there was little I could do, and that is when the forest orchards and farms began to turn on you. 
slowly and steadily company dug large craters with your help and before we knew new walls marked the hamlet's new edge a small clinic and school were mere destructions my friend but his but his swoop stealthily displaced my home and stashed away your village lands now when things lie rather calm and vacant i wonder how will this new swoop again change your lands uh, i will briefly sketch out the other two stories here uh, the third story is of leela who encounters samai who is time itself in the human form of a young boy in her uh, small garden planted with the help of a, uh, women in the hamlet uh in in the current moment uh, the indigenous community claims for a collective future of in intergenerational mining and uh, replanting their orchards uh, plans are already drawn uh, by the community in regards for this future aspiration uh, however on a close reading of the site one realizes that if you look closely at the grave that many small groups are articulating new practices through smaller collectives such as reviving devsthans replanting chili farms uh, women running cooperatives of catering packaging and tailoring and many more such instances have started emerging on the site and my last story is around a conversation uh, between two scavengers uh, the badlap an old vulture, uh, vulture and trucker a new member of the scavenging community the trucker uh, let me uh, dog back is also uh, the migrant uh, represents the migrant community who shifted over here in sonshi uh, with no claims to any land tucker awaits for company to begin mining the craters meanwhile he pets in these abandoned spaces salvaging material of the industrial present to craft new furniture or members that get used in building homes uh, around the area uh, even timber planted by company is cut down clandestinely to sell or make objects of sto as stools or tables here while the notions of home and permanence are still in question for the migrant family uh, salvage and scavenging uh, thus become instrumental in, in recrafting the geography of the landscape for them and it continues to anchor this community to the landscape to come up with new material practices uh, therefore uh, to summarize all of these stories i would like to rearticulate my research question which is uh, how do completing imaginations of futures of post extractive mining landscapes at sonshi goa shape their present uh, let me let, uh, and this question is uh, mostly based in three kinds of argument uh, the, the first thing i argue for is a rethinking of the relationship between social fractures and spatiality in order to go beyond definitions of impasses and wastelands and further architectural discourse that 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 might emerge out of alternative provocations from the site uh, uh, by by this i mean that uh, to look more closely to uh, Uh, to the different ideas of future of sonchi's uh, land by the inhabitants through the multiple futures that are getting inhabited uh, that are getting imagined by them that go beyond uh, either mining or restoring the landscape uh, secondly i argue, i argue for uh, moving architectural discourse beyond extreme ends of a teleological future of intense resource uh, extraction of this wasteland and a dystop uh, which is which is a dystopic imagination and the urge to return to a pristine environment and thus the vision of a utopic future uh, thirdly i use architecture and storytelling as a method uh, to open up the relationships of uh, of 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 uh, the agency of the architect and uh, and uh, with this uh, there are three questions that emerge over here in this landscape about uh, who is the architect in the story and what does the architect inter interrogate through its stories and uh, what future provocations does the architect sketch in the of of the future and uh, so my first story through kavlo from the indigenous indigenous gauda community inter interrogates the spatial tension which which emerges which emerges from the interpretation of the landscape as a wasteland uh, to sketch out the polemic uh, debate on the new non human takeovers in these landscapes uh, the second story chanari a sacred blackbird tree from the devrai assumes the role of an architect to interrogate and a uh, state To, to interrogate to interrogate the state and indigenous communities efforts of restoring environmental resources to their pristine natures uh, by doing this uh, i open out the cultural differences that uh, indigeneity makes in advancing the uh, conversation around uh, conservation of environmental resources uh, the third story where the architect is ravindev the goddess of health and pestilence uh, interrogates the new spatial narratives of health based in cleaning and greening the environments that erodes claims of diverse groups to creating privatized uh, pleasure gardens here the architect articulates a provocation or, or here the architect also articulates a provocation of uh, 
village health that gets based in the protection of commons on one hand and on the other hand the tactical interventions that get operationalized to expand work and amenity based claims to the narrative of health uh, the fourth story samay the spirit of time itself inter interrogates a single singular vision based in the intergenerational mining that is posed uh, by doing this he sketches out uh, multiple diverse futures based on smaller collectives from the side that are mentioned before and the final story of the badluck the vulture interrogates the spatial narrative of wasteland wasteland beyond the notions of productivity uh, which helps uh, you to sketch a future based in the economy of salvaging and scavenging and the new networks of craftsmanship that are embedded in uh, which operate beyond land claims uh, i think that's my time thank you thank you thank you vasudev sir uh, sorry i mentioned to forgot that the format will be that we will have all the three presentations back to back and then we'll have a discussion uh, in the end so in so in that sense i'll, I'll invite rohit uh, vastavikta again and shreya kothavle to present uh, their presentation yeah. over to you thanks thanks shreya um vastavikta you run the presentation uh, the whole presentation right yeah yeah okay um so the presentation that we are going to make uh, that i'm going to make along with my colleagues vastavikta and shreya is a part of a last, larger research program at c that is situated in our interests of developing thinking around ward level in, environment information systems on on the one hand and histories of mumbai suburbanization on the other hand it is also a part of an ongoing collaborative conversation with several colleagues from mumbai and the university of pennsylvania to think about a provocation on mumbai as an inhabited sea as uh, since 2005 there has been a steady rise in reportage around about mumbai facing several environmental crises infrastructural and build form collapse due to emerging conditions of weather change particularly rainfall what is common amongst many such articles is the emphasis that infrastructural interventions haven't been able to future proof the city in the face of weather change business as usual in spatial practice to implement new infrastructure projects such as the coastal road is seen as an unwieldy direction to proceed with if mumbai of the future will look like what it used to do during the 17th century warns nikhil anand and carolyn terrence several pra spatial practitioners have begun to speculate mumbai's urban form that might emerge due to the rising seas and long periods of water inundation these images instill shock and awe but also raise a polemic debate about what the spatiality of a submerged city would be of the not so distant future on a more serious note pankaj joshi an eminent voice in mumbai's city planning discussion points towards the regulatory and design directions that spatial practitioners ought to consider in the face of the rising sea however in this article the larger point that pankaj joshi underscores is that academia ought to play an important role in spatial practice in envisioning what he calls as a reduce reuse recycle model of development in a similar way nikhil anand calls for a spatial practice to not only be ambitious in ways that radically differ from ambitious proposals of the pre preceding centuries but also imaginative and just he points us towards the work of dilip dikuna and anuradha mathu to rethink the relationship between water and land in articulating imaginative proposals on the one hand and spatial practice to be inclusive of diverse populations particularly low income groups our present research builds on these calls for thinking about the inhabited city such an articulation we believe is only possible when one reflects on the weave of the social and natural histories of localities and what this weave might mean in terms of thinking about urbanization and architecture but more specifically we also find that the voices of households and their experiences in the face of weather change and rising seas are missing in current articulations of new imagination in this exploratory research 
we therefore operationalize our concern by asking how do households shape and get shaped by the wetness of build form in a tropical coastal city our focus is on mumbai's r ward which presents an intricate coastline that to an extent can only be found in historical maps our research has been based in five settlements namely dolat nagar ambawadi exer gautan ganpat patil nagar and govind nagar in 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 this area so uh, these are these are diverse geographies they include uh build forms such as chawls wadis low rise apartments bungalows and as well as high rise apartments in the process of addressing our question we've engaged in deep conversations and listening to and along with 16 households who inhabit the wadis chawls bungalows low rise and high rise apartments in these five settlements so our process our method of exploration has been based on listening to the 16 households and we kind of conducted four months of field work uh, from last uh, december to march until uh, corona struck us um in building our interpretive framework to analyze the in intersection of social and natural histories of localities we draw on four types of literature first we draw on the work of dilip tikuna and anuradha mathu who point towards the methods of state who point towards the problems of state simplification in thinking about mapping the land water interface and suggest that aqueous flows be valued in such processes more than that of land second we draw on the work of a range of urbanists who draw attention towards the plural legal institutional and political frameworks that are central to the settling of land and built form third we draw on the work of planners who have emphasized on the need to value life spaces in complex systems and in the face of em emergent directions of collaborative action and fourthly we draw on the work of architects whose focus on typological studies and material practices that shape type and build form which complements inquiries into life spaces drawing on these works we propose to consider the intersection of social histories social and natural histories of localities that is the wetness of build form as a capacity or porosity to soak or not soak the flux of settling life spaces aqueous flows and material practices so this is the conceptual framework that we've kind of built and it has emerged actually by asking questions of the material that emerged from the interviews themselves uh we will discuss three interviews my colleagues vastavikta and uh, uh shreya will discuss three households in terms of how household describe uh how they were shaped and were shaped by the wetness of built from in a tropical city yeah over to you vastavikta and then shreya The map on the left is of a wadi owned by an entrepreneurial land owner named Dalit Ram around the 1930s along the western banks of the Daisa River in Salsa. Uh, when the West Indian Railway uh, uh, came in and connected the region uh, to uh, the other presidencies, many like said Dalit Ram uh, realized uh, the potential of this land and started building second homes and orchards over here. Uh, he also, like many others, got inspired by the housing schemes of the Bombay City Improvement Trust and subdivided his wadi. into uh, housing schemes uh, into privately plotted uh, bungalow schemes as seen on the right hand side of the map uh, plots were sold uh, uh, plots were sold uh, to refi uh, to refugees of partition around uh, the the 1950s 1960s that were uh, migrating over here and were mainly from the sindh uh, and this land was thus deemed favorable by them to come and settle along the banks of the aqueous flows of the daisa river uh the life spaces within and along the river uh are were very different from what it is today uh, one senior resident describes a neighborhood was like harappa and mohenjodaro small square bungalows along right angle st streets sharing common walls uh the river was absolutely crystal clear and flowing throughout the whole year there was ample space within and there were trees all around we used to go there to swim and have a bath If at all we had to visit the national park, we had to cross the river. 
He was married into a Sindhi refugee household, which settled here in 1950s in the Bangalore typology along the banks of this river. Uh, my husband's family consisted of his uh, parents and their three sons and four daughters. Uh, this house is divided into the left uh, red half, which was uh, uh, used where the domestic life unfolded, and the right hand side half was where uh, the, they, they ran a geostat factory. He says, Around the 1980s, by this time, I was married and living here with the family. Uh, the daughters had moved out after their marriage. The home reconfigured but with each son taking a bedroom. Uh, and separate toilets were added rather incrementally. Uh, by 2005, the patriarch had already met his demise and the factory had shut and the bungalow had gotten divided into three separate uh, households. So over here, the red, yellow and uh, purple are the three divisions within this bungalow. And uh, it was also placed in the context of uh, redevelopment, uh, where the daughters filed the case to stake their claims on the property. Uh, this slide is just a comparative analysis of the change in the family structure and thus the layering, folding, and shedding of the house itself. Uh, a senior resident uh, remembers the aqueous floors uh, of, of, of her home, uh, that, of, that the home witnessed. She says, in 2005, the force of the water was so much that I could not close, the, close my doors. I just managed to latch it and push the door. The flood, but this wasn't the first flood that this neighborhood saw. The first flood that we experienced was in 1968. After this, there were 15 such consecutive floods of different intensities. Each time the floods uh, bring in black sludge. It, can, it contains soil and silt from the hills, garbage, debris, sewage, and non-human life forms like fishes and cows that are pushed into our homes. Uh, post uh, 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 the, the government, after this, made a large retaining wall to hold the course of the river post this deluge. But the estuary always found its way into our home. As the waters recede, she remembers that all the neighbors used to come together and mend their common spaces. Practices of cleaning and uh, their households was also dominant around this time. Uh, uh, she ties up the context of redevelopment to the deluge of 2005, however where she says that after, uh, when two-thirds two of their homes were underwater, uh, the new high-rises started replacing the bungalows. Uh, uh, the aqueous flows uh, make the walls uh, porous and more water than mud over here. Uh, she narrates her everyday experience. Touch this wall, cool and damp and almost malleable. Small organic life like mushrooms, funguses and mosses make home here. And they cause several coughs and uh, breathing problems. However, even human life and practices see and due to the porosity of these walls itself. Our new practices of repairing and mending by contractors and laborers creates a seasonal economy to address the aqueous flows that take this home. Uh, the typology itself uh, transforms uh, in, in, in the monsoon, where a new ground is created uh, uh, for, for, for humans and uh, their valuables to shift up. Your new roofs are added, uh, extensions are made to the walls to, to hide their uh, uh, to hide their faces and uh, practices of retiling and repainting also come into play. Secondly, the materiality of the furniture completely changes from uh, timber to uh, raw iron or uh, stone or plastic. Uh, the senior widow, however, exclaims, I spend at least 20,000 to 1 lakh on repairs, even if it's to use to paint cheap distemper or do a simple termite treatment. And finally, a kit of parts of new materiality and practices comes together to make home in this estuarine landscape. Uh, the intersection of our articulators, as mentioned by Rohit through time, has changed the typology of the bungalow within the settlement itself. Uh, in some cases, the low-rise CHSs, which are seen in the light orangish pink, occurred uh, in the 1980s. And the post-2005 high-rise apartments uh, got enabled by TDR itself, uh, which is seen in the dark red. However, many families uh, uh, like uh, like uh, like this this household uh, uh, face an impasse as multiple claims contest the house. Uh, and even in these typological shifts, we observe that the forces of wetness in the everyday continue to uh, operate, affecting all of these typologies. These cooperative housing societies were built by members belonging to various communities by pooling resources and money. Small buildings with 15 to 20 families living together in flats gave an indication for the new form of suburban life the city aspired for. During the 1990s, along with TDR getting operationalized, newer, infrastru newer infrastructural changes of addition of flyovers over the Dhaisar River and the sharpening of the river edge 
led to the restricted flow of water, making the settlement vulnerable to flooding. Next, until the 1990s. Next. Until the 1990s, Dolat Nagar had smaller cooperative housing societies along with bungalows inhabited by the Gujarati and Jain community along with the refugees of partition from Sindh and Punjab. The built form allowed for a rich social life where one of the senior residents who shifted here around this time describes, boundary walls barely existed within our societies. People knew each other and came together from all the neighboring societies and bungalows to celebrate all festivals. We spoke across society compounds and across the balconies. The temples and community halls became spaces of celebration. However, post 2005, the tedia further led to the tall high rise apartments. The lives of families became more insular and no one really spoke to each other. The social life thus transformed with the change in fabric. Next. The next resident, the, the same resident lives in a ground floor flat bought around the late 90s in the old cooperative housing building. He shifted here from Santa Cruz post his retirement with his wife and daughter and two nephews. This area connected our hometown to Navs uh, our hometown Navsari and my nephews to the shops in Surat. Also, this flat was affordable for me as the building was old. Here in the diagram, the red represents the area inhabited by the senior resident along with his wife and daughter. The yellow where his ne nephews resided, the purple indicates spaces of public interaction. Next. The, later, the nephews used the house as a place to store and to come in on weekends to sleep, whereas the rest of the space was used by the husband-wife duo. We expanded the house by covering the balconies and added, added lofts for storage. The ground floor allowed me to interact and talk to all the passerbys of the society. Next. As of today, the senior resident resides here along with his wife post their daughter's marriage and the shifting of his nephews. The red indicates the spaces inhabited by the couple. I spend most of my time here in the balcony observing the street. Both of us are retired and at home with our children gone. There is little for us to do. Next. However, I fear the Dhaisar River right across the street during the monsoon. When the water is released from the dam, it gushes into the river with a violent sound and into our home. In 2005, I climbed up the platform. My, dad, my daughter began crying. We were so scared and then we heard people banging on our door, doors. Some residents came with tires to ferry us out of our homes to the terrace of the adjoining building. Next. The streets and our homes are filled with sludge, debris and sewage. It leaves a horrible stench and all our surfaces become black. Next. The CHS undergoes weathering, not only due to the extreme events of flooding during the monsoon, but also due to the everyday wetness that affects the aging of the building. The senior resident, being a part of the CHS committee, says the practices of repair, repairing the CHS are carried out as a collective by a form managing committee where repainting, adding of tarps on terraces, repaving the internal streets, and maintenance of infrastructure is done. The Jain temple within a precinct also provides funds for repair works. Next. However, the repair of our houses are done by residents individually based on their economic feasibility. The resident worried about the condition of his house says, the house faces weathering when the water seeps in from the ground as well as our walls perpetually when fungus and blisters form. The walls crack and bulge out and look how the walls have separated from the beam. We see, we see some tiling, but, the, but the, we did some tiling, but the tile also loosen out due to the dampness and the moisture that osmotes within the wall. Moreover, the forceful increase of water from the river in the event of flood has led to the rupturing of tiles from the floor. Next. Material practices get operationalized in the form of repairing the external walls by using old grills and cement to form a reinforced structural wall to adding tarpaulin. With an aspiration of redevelopment of the CHS, the resident says, I have retired long time ago. I cannot afford 20 to 30,000 rupees of repair works. I am living in this condition in a hope for redevelopment to happen. We are also asked not to do any major repair works as the Finally, the kit of parts that makes the home in these conditions 
is based on the ease of repairs and the resistance to the extreme conditions of weathering next the residents hold on to their homes with an aspiration of redevelopment redevelopment uh the operational the operationalization of tdr would allow for next the next case is of ambawadi around 1940s in the agrarian landscape of borivli towards the north of dolat nagar settlement along the dhaisar river was settled by a north indian community who raised cows in cattle sheds however post independence the fabric of this settlement saw substantial change the city experienced a flow of migration in search of work and thus this part of the suburb the cowshed owners saw this as an opportunity to provide single room homes for these migrants pratiba nagar chol in ambawadi was built by one such cattle shed owner who rented single rooms next the drawing above represents a form of life which existed before the 1960s where the north indian community lived and worked along the edge where the social life unfolded on the on the uh, one of the senior resident conjectures the proximity to the river and ample of grass along its bank must have been favorable for the cattle to graze this transformed post independence with the influx of labor migrants inhabiting these rooms the resident further iterates the transformation due to the absence of a formal plan the settlement with time grew densely in all directions where the streets became extensions to these densely inhabited colonies where social life unfolded next The drawing represents this form of urban life around the 1980s at the household level. The purple is a social space where the life unfolded on the street. The larger yellows and the reds are spaces which were used for resting, and the smaller yellows and reds where the informal kitchenette and storage spaces were housed. Next, post the 2000s, the social grain, grain changed from labor migrants sharing these colonies to families settling in. The retired shop owner who migrated around the same time says. there was a growing need for space and hence lofts got added which also served as storage to shift our belongings in the event of a flood the space of sleeping versus cooking and storing and washing became more defined here as seen in the diagram that articulates these clear segregation next the settlement as of today has evolved and has better what and has better infrastructures structure with individual water connections and toilets within and outside the house in the shop owner's home a private toilet is added where his whereas his neighbor says we got this tap recently when a house got numbered by the municipality these taps get used for washing utensils and clothes collectively between families next the settlement faces extreme floods every year due to its proximity to the dhaisar river it negotiates with these events at the settlement level as a collective a resident says the water gushes in with a boiling roar the floods bring along snakes and fishes along with black sludge that stays even even when the water recedes we have our own information systems by monitoring the rise of water in our drains the people are evacuated and the schools and temples become places of refuge here for the neighborhood as the flood recedes the community engages in cleaning of the settlement as a collective next the dense fabric of the neighborhood restricts the flow of wind uh one slide behind watch yeah the dense fabric of the neighborhood restricts the flow of wind and natural light into the homes moreover the everyday flows of water from washing and cleaning tend to persist within these conditions in the common streets which aggregate during the monsoon the materiality and techniques of construction also play a major role in the weathering of the built form our walls are always damp where they meet the ground the paint peels and blisters and the developed mosses flooring turns black and uneven in level where this dampness is the worst i have decided to tile the walls in spite of adding tarpatri water still seeps in from the cracks of the roof next the practices of inhabitation change in with the seasons the sub, in the summer the outdoors become spaces of active public life blurring the inside and the outside pre monsoon the lofts become spaces of resting and valuables are shifted making the impending arrival of monsoon during the monsoon the families are wary of the turbulent river and are thus prepared for evacuation post monsoon the outdoors become spaces for airing out the furniture and dampness within the homes next 
Due to the lack of affordance, only repair and retrofit become viable here. Both the neighbors say, we incur a cost of nearly 15 to 20,000 to tile or paint with cheap distemper. The roof is layered with tops every three to five years. This is all we can afford. The practices of repair adopted by the families themselves create a cyclic economy where services and materials are exchanged, reused, and appropriated based on needs and affordances. Next. The change in materiality of furniture to lighter wrought iron and plastic objects, along with practices of retiling the home, adding lofts, engage with the experience of wetness of these households. Next. The residents engage in the regularization of the in infrastructure with a hope for redevelopment of the Charlies under the SRA scheme. Hence, they engage in practices of repair and retrofit to negotiate with wetness. That's my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Victor. I'll just, take, I'll just take a minute to summarize the conclusions. Yeah, sure. sure. So, uh, so, I mean, what we've done and this kind of stories, the depth, in depth stories, the three stories that were told by Vastavikta and Shreya, the material that we collected uh, um, helped shape our inter interpretive framework in the sense that that has been one of our interventions. This interpretive frame. Uh, to look at the intersection of natural and social histories, uh, in which we use the analytical ladder of settling, life spaces, aqueous flows, and material practices to develop a narrative inquiry. And these stories essentially open out fragments of time and the weave of life. Next. Um, uh, go, go next. I'll kind of end. Go next. So what are our findings over here? Go back, Avastavikta, one. Yeah. So what are, what are our findings over here? Firstly, there is, I mean, it, it, in Bombay, we know the story of TDR uh, as a story where redevelopment takes place uh, with uh, where high property prices are high. In areas around Borivli, redevelopment seems to be taking place where around areas which are being prone to flooding. Across all of the typologies that we kind of found or discussed, this 16 household, there are shared experiences of finding a new ground. So that's number one. Uh, and that new ground may not only be a higher level within the house, but also finding a new ground in terms of other people's houses on higher levels, but also social institutions like the temple or the school, which become places to find refuge for these houses. Second uh, point uh, is that uh, in these shared experiences, also there, there is a hope across all uh, households living in all different typologies to move towards redevelopment, which is what they're kind of waiting for. But redevelopment is not feasible everywhere. This may be due to the uh, 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 judicial cases, as we saw in the first uh, story. This may be due to the po due to uh, residents not coming to a, a consensus about redevelopment in the second story, or this may be due to in a, in a, in a child settlement process of regularization that are underway, which does not, doesn't allow for the redevelopment to materialize. In the meantime, when redevelopment is not materializing, there are several processes of repair and uh, retrofit that are underway. So this is the larger finding of this research. Apart from this, I mean, I'll just kind of make one point and end this presentation, is that is in terms of thinking about suburbanization or histories of suburbanization, we know, uh, I, I mean, we know of the sub, we've kind of, we've, We've been told of the suburbs as places of residence, residence from where people go to the city to work. In all of these stories, we found new patterns of entrepreneurship uh, that, that, has, that, that are pointing towards significant, significant uh, economic and spatial changes that are underway. I'll just leave it at that, but not develop on, on that point. The present. Thanks, uh, Ramit. Uh, sorry, I did not know you were going to summarize. Um, thanks again for the, for the presentation, guys. I think it leads, uh, rather it provides a nice entry point to the next presentation by Prasad and Komal.
uh, titled Housing Repair and Retrofitting. Uh, so over to you, Prasad and Komal. Thanks, thanks. Komal, you uh, present your screen, please. So I'll just uh, uh, begin by saying that, you know, uh, Komal, you, you start the screen, please. Yeah. Yeah. Go to the first slide, please. Yeah. Visible? Next one, please. Yeah. So uh, the previous one. So uh, we she started this project three or four years ago, and uh, it it was located within the housing question, and uh, uh, the housing question in India, particularly uh, for the last twenty years or so, has been articulated in a very specific way that there is a housing shortage, and. Uh, in 2013-14, uh, there was a number given to it. That is, there are there is a shortage of 18 million houses, uh, you know, which across the country, which 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 uh, uh, which are required. Uh, the same report, which is the Kundu Committee report, also said something very interesting. That out of these 18 million houses which are short. Uh, 16 million or more are actually there, but they are in many ways small, congested, you know, dilapidated, and 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 and, and, and sketched it like that. Uh, if you look at the case of Mumbai itself, and, and this study will kind of, you know, uh, it's a three year long study focused on Mumbai because Mumbai has a whole variety of, uh, you know, uh, uh, housing opportunities. Now, before that, before that, one more point that the, the shortage argument that there are less number of houses makes the housing question into a commodity, commodity uh, you know, question. You, know, you, you produce houses, houses seen as a commodity which needs to be supplied and, and, and that supply has to be done uh, through an efficient market. So that's, that's the way things have been going. And, and since last 20 years or so, various governments have been, you know, you know very generously kind of, you know, setting up policies and, and financial systems, financial, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms to produce new housing. And Bombay has seen the most generous of policies and, and financial mechanisms to, to, for, 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 for such uh, housing production. If you look at the numbers in Bombay itself, if you look at the demand in Bombay, you see the total demand of something like 17.7 lakh houses. You know, this, this includes, you know, half the population living in the slums, 20% uh, living in chawls, and 20%, you know, uh, living in, uh, uh, in dilapidated conditions. But if you look at the supply in the last 20 years, in the, in the, in the, during the same period, you will see the supply has been around 3.25 lakhs. Which means that if we were to build new houses to solve the housing problem, it will take more than 100 years. It's very clear that there is no capacity with the state include and the private sector to address the housing problem through building new houses. I mean, this is a very clear thing. And, and this is happening in the context of the most generous policies and financial mechanisms. So, so then, then how does one go about it? So we come to that particular point where Kundu committee report kind of, you know, specifies this, that the housing shortage is also due to dilapidation and congestion. A lot of people living in small houses, as well as housing being dilapidated and you know, uh, uh, you know, having having inhabitable conditions to live. So this very clearly produces a context for repair, retrofit, expansion, upgradation of existing housing stock, and it appears to us very clearly that that is 
the best way to kind of you know deal with the housing question you know not not necessarily only through building new houses because because just because there is no capacity i mean as a straight power uh, you know uh, uh, reading and the figures are very similar for other urban contexts also in india you know i was involved with the uh, with the with the uh, housing uh, policy in karnataka urban housing policy the figures are very similar it's only 10% of the house uh, housing shortage which is kind of you know which is kind of provided by building new houses though there is a clear context for repair and retrofit and expansion and improvement and upgradation and this has been the country of you know repair and retrofit and upgradation and improvement across india there is no architecture school or engineering school which trains students in repair retrofit improvement upgradation expansion it does there is there is no there is no course there are no standards there are no you know tendering processes there are no engineering interests there is there is there, there is there are courses on conservation but then that's a very there is that's very monumental conservation and stuff like that you know it's it's a it's a very different kind of a a a, a, a discourse so this is the reason why c decided to kind of you know look at look at what does it mean to kind of you know set up a course for on repair and retrofit and and that became the that became the uh, kind of the basis for the study go to the next slide please what we did was we we the study was done in collaboration with the students of you know uh, of c uh, i mean it was their studio and it was conducted with the first three batches a14 a15 and a16 and uh, some students of a17 as well it was done you know uh, uh, komal is uh, has been uh, central to the studio she has been conducting the studio uh, apurva sharma joined uh, the studio uh, shreya kodavle was a part of this exercise uh, of this of this project at some point so, and there were plenty of other people experts and you know uh, uh, engineers and 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 bureaucrats who kind of you know got involved in 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 giving their input the three years were structured like this the first year we decided to kind of you know look at study the context i mean see what is the scope what is the context for each of these uh, for 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 uh, 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 repair and retrofit the second year we decided to look at existing practices of repair and retrofit and third year we decided to develop strategies for 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 repair and retrofit through our earlier studies on housing we recognize that you know there are four specific contexts one is that of old dilapidated buildings old old inner city housing and this is there across india the second is the context of slum housing in bombay it is around 40 47% of people live in slum housing the third is the cooperative housing societies apartments of the 60s and the 70s you know and, the, and also the 80s which are undergoing redevelopment which are problems of repairs etc and the fourth is the urban villages you know uh, which are which are which are growing internally as as if imploding really so these became the four contexts i will ask uh, komal to uh, continue the presentation with the details of the uh, study komal yeah thanks sir uh, so with the close reading of the context uh, we identified in the first year uh, the stresses uh, in all these contexts Uh, this is a plan of the Exer village, uh, which was one of the urban villages we studied, where uh, there is congestion due to haphazard uh, growth of uh, as families grow, uh, the ground floor structures become ground plus one, ground plus two story structures, and uh, this sort of uh, stresses the infrastructure as well as creates problems of light ventilation, etc., at the neighborhood level. At the level of the house, also uh, the stresses are clearly seen uh, from the outside. Uh, there are inadequate uh, sort of windows. Uh, because the expansions are very haphazard, and this results in a problem of uh, dampness and darkness in the house through the day. Uh, there's little relief space uh, to create more windows because of the furniture. Uh, with the old mass housing stock, uh, which was uh, particularly the chawls, uh, there were general problems of uh, repair and maintenance because after Rent Control Act of 1948, uh, the, the landowners were not uh, uh, were not interested in uh, repairing the buildings. Uh, except the buildings were heavily used, and uh, there was the families continued to grow, new families continued to move in. So, along with the general uh, repair and maintenance uh, of the house, 
uh, there was also uh, a lot of extensions which were seen, which were very ad hoc, very, uh, uh, very uh, in the moment. But uh, what uh, they uh, sometimes grew to uh, retrofit uh, uh, newer services like uh, air conditioners and attached toilets. Uh, sometimes they grew to uh, in enclose a whole room uh, within the same unit. Uh, the third context was a slum where at the level of the neighborhood, uh, uh, we looked at uh, the problems of uh, overall infrastructure, uh, which was uh, sanitation, sewerage, uh, drainage, etc., water supply. Uh, this is uh, uh, on the right. You see uh, Ganpat Patil slum and how that, uh, which is in Borivli, and it is located uh, to the uh, west of the Link Road, where uh, it grew into the marshes. Uh, so it is also uh, particularly sitting on precarious lands, which is where generally slums uh, develop because uh, that's the only space in the city that they can afford. Uh, coming to the house uh, level, uh, the uh, houses are mostly uh, fragile, very fragile. There's low light and ventilation. Uh, there's dampness constant uh, because of the leakage from the roof and seepage from the ground, uh, also because it's sitting on a precarious piece of land, uh, and also electric wires, etc., which make it uh, which make it dangerous to stay. Uh, in the fourth context, uh, which was the old cooperative housing societies, it was general repair and retrofit. Uh, due to neglect of maintenance, etc., that was mostly observed. That was a major stress uh, due to the dilapidating structure. In some cases, there were balcony enclosures or there were additional balconies that were added, which resulted in uh, stress to the uh, original structure. Uh, of course, problems of seepage and dampness uh, caused uh, other problems like spalling of plaster and exposure of the reinforcement, etc. So here we are summarizing uh, the four uh, stresses in the four uh, contexts that we discussed. Uh, part two of the study looked at uh, the existing practices, uh, which was basically a stage uh, before intervening in these contexts, uh, where we wanted to understand what is happening on the ground. Uh, we wanted to collect stories from the field. So we went back to the four contexts. Uh, and we wanted to also harness knowledge from the field and then eventually intervene uh, within this. Uh, we also, along with uh, the existing practices, studied, studied existing networks. Uh, for for instance, there was a whole network of contractors, uh, small local uh, uh, masons who were involved in repair and retrofit on this, uh, in the various contexts. Um, in the old villages, uh, there were two kinds of expansion which was happening. There was uh, incremental expansion of the existing houses itself. So there was horizontal expansion in the sense that the veranda spaces, etc., got enclosed, uh, but also uh, extension of floors uh, because there was no space to expand horizontally after a point. Uh, and also one house uh, expanding vertically uh, would include a staircase which would basically uh, you know start a chain of possibilities for the neighboring cluster to also expand uh, of course it resulted in um, light and ventilation issues uh, which uh, is evident uh, the other kind of uh, expansion which also happened was expansion with redevelopment where uh, where they started from a clean slate and basically made a new pakka house which was the apartment type uh, where the small contractors were involved in uh, the redevelopment of this. And the finances for both these cases, uh, in the first case, came from the inhabitants themselves because they were expanding for themselves, uh, larger families. And in the second case, it either came from the people who uh, were uh, keeping the houses uh, to sell or rent or the contractor himself uh, or herself if uh, they were uh, selling the houses. Uh, there was, in this case, uh, for old villages, there are no sort of regulations. So everything, uh, all these kind of expansions, whether it's the first case or the second, happen under uh, a casual repair permission, which is just given by the municipality. Uh, this is, uh, again, to show uh, how flows are extended with the uh, typical ladi koba ladi technique, where uh, you use steel frames and then uh, lay it over with uh, stone tiles, on top of which there's big bat koba, and, uh, uh, and uh, finished off with ceramic tiles to uh, form the new roof for the floor. And, uh, the effects are that the inside space, uh, the quality of construction is always questionable because uh, because of, uh, local contractors are carrying it out. And there is a stress on the infrastructure, on the existing infrastructure, because new services are constantly added and retrofitting is constantly done. Coming to the old uh, housing stock, here there are three agencies which are involved. There is a repair board, which uh, sometimes uh, comes in to repair certain stuff, uh, which is uh, uh, which basically uses the rent, uh, rent control uh, the rent cess which is collected uh, from the from these buildings uh, there is uh, the local contractors or the masons who uh, again become part of the network who the individual house owners or the unit owners uh, will call for any kind of extensions that they need to carry out, carry out. 
uh, and uh, also there is of course the developers get involved in case there is a redevelopment uh, where they make uh, profit by selling the additional houses here you are typically uh, typically the repairs involve uh, you know replacing the broken tiles and waterproofing and uh, a lot of uh, patch repair in case the uh, reinforcement gets exposed there is also expansion which is horizontal in nature which is seen uh, in order to uh, retrofit with air conditioners uh, or to have another bathroom or even uh, sort of rooms uh, it is uh, of course very ad hoc and uh, uh, and uh, it is uh, they use i sections uh, and then finish it off sort of enclose the extension with uh, gi sheets or brickwork or uh, grills etc uh, in uh, uh, in case of redevelopment uh, this current form of the housing uh, undergoes a massive change because it changes to an apartment type uh, versus this type which is a a uh, very porous and uh, uh, sort of interactive in that sense and uh, and and the lived experience uh, changes because the outside shrinks and the uh, inside sort of becomes larger in the slums uh, we see the uh, we see there are two things which are happening one is at the level of the neighborhood uh, uh, scale which is uh, the slum improvement board uh, does provide the uh, Uh, infrastructure in the sense of uh, water supply, drainage, sewerage, etc. But uh, in case that is absent, uh, people sort of figure out their own methods. This, these are some houses which have been documented from the Ganpat Patil slum, where uh, you see a slow incremental uh, sort of uh, uh, you know marginal improvement to the house happening as and when finances get collected. So, so it's slow, it's incremental, uh, it's consolidated over time, and in the process, they spend a lot of money, but. Uh, but it it gives them the uh, space of space to do it over time so it involves a series of negotiations with the neighbors with uh, with the local contractors and masons and they uh, figure out the details depending on uh, what is available the material here comes from the second hand markets which are uh, which are in the neighborhood or from construction waste or debris uh, they also use this to line the streets because they are sitting on a marsh uh, and uh, the construction debris is basically a layer that is Laid year after year uh, to form some sort of paving. In case of the old cooperative housing societies, the existing practices are usually uh, overall repairs. A lot of uh, emergence of overall uh, repair practices have has been repair contractors has been seen. They generally take care of the waterproofing, seepage, uh, and strengthening of the structural members. Uh, the society members in this case, in this case, in this case, bear the cost. Uh, there is not much change in spatiality except for sometimes a few uh, extensions but uh, again if it is redevelopment uh, then it uh, completely changes the spatiality there is a new density the outside shrinks again uh, the uh, flats become larger they become uh, more expensive uh, but also it is more res high resource consumption uh, this new form uh, which is redeveloped because there are multi level parking there are pools etc uh, which uh, function so uh, here here we are summarizing the current practices of responses where basically in the old villages and the slums uh, there is uh, an overall uh, infrastructure uh, which is uh, which is either missing or uh, uh, the slum board or the uh, uh, the municipality sort of steps in with the old dilapidated stocks and the cooperative housing stock it is general repairs and in the old dilapidated stock there are also uh, additional extensions a uh, redevelopment in all cases uh, is a possibility but uh, it is it is a problem because uh, it is generally high uh, resource consuming uh, it, it is also a huge uh, finances are required uh, it is a slow process because it requires consensus it is also a market dependent process uh, and thus uh, we argue for repair and retrofit because it's uh, because uh, Uh, because it is it is the opposite of redevelopment and because it is uh, it can be done uh, slow incrementally and it does not uh, require the kind of uh, resources so we are asking to strengthen its processes so based on the first two years of the study uh, which was identifying ex identifying the context uh, and identifying the existing practices there were certain learnings a uh, very clear learnings which uh, i will run you through uh, the first one was that uh, all kinds of uh, government uh, policy driven interventions Uh, of supplying bulk infrastructure etc they pushed uh, the housing but uh, but there was not great production of infrastructure or of uh, or of uh, improvement of housing uh, instead these failures led to redevelopment uh, which was uh, which completely changed the lived experience of uh, uh, the and also the social and cultural fabric of the inhabitants the second is that the inhabitants have been repairing and mobilizing their own uh, networks uh, 
like we saw in the existing practices uh, the networks get formed only uh, the only thing is that right now they are ad hoc and they are insufficient to sustain for long term and uh, for a quality uh, improvement but uh, that can be looked at um, the there's a new way of thinking that needs to come in uh, because the processes of intervention uh, over here are not uh, starting from a clean state it's not that abila rasa approach uh, it's not the modern approach instead you see the slow negotiations there is a wait and watch situation uh, it's incremental and uh, we're saying that uh, uh, that uh, although no standards are followed uh, we can look at that uh, as one of the learnings uh, the the next point is that there is an engineering uh, aspect to repair and retrofit but also there are questions of uh, space form and habitation that can be asked which is uh, the prerogative of the architectural realm then um, we're also saying that an ecosystem approach is required uh, where you have soft regulatory landscape small capacity augmentations and an overall networking uh, approach and we will discuss this further and uh, and we are also seeing that architectural academy are here can get involved in uh, multiple ways uh, which is provide training and also provide consultations wherever required develop awareness develop maintenance manuals etc so from these learnings we uh, come to the scope what kind of a scoping is required uh, which is uh, our, uh, the step just before uh, we propose our interventions so in the old urban villages it is the expansion and the neighborhood level infrastructure upgradation in the old dilapidated stock it is a retrofitting with the modern services uh, and also other basic repairs in the slums again there is a neighborhood level infrastructure upgradation physical as well as social and uh, of course improvement of the uh, condition of the houses and in the cooperative housing societies there is largely structural repair uh, and waterproofing uh, seepage uh, those problems Uh, so, what are the processes that are required uh, here? Uh, we are saying that uh, in case of uh, uh, the processes required for the uh, for this scope uh, to be achieved, we are saying that the villages villages require uh, government agencies to step in uh, with uh, uh, at the scale of uh, infrastructure plans and uh, uh, overall uh, scoping. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for the household level, the local contractors as well as the uh, individual house owners can uh, look at. So there is. architecture engineering construction all kinds of expertise required uh, in case of the old massing stock it is largely the individuals who uh, take care of the uh, un, uh, take care of the improvements and upgradation but uh, the state can uh, 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 sort of come in or the repair board can step in and uh, uh, and use the repair board cess collection etc there's also a maintenance strategy which will be required uh, for the slums again there is uh, at the neighborhood level uh, the slum board Uh, uh can play a role where uh, for social infrastructure and upgradation plan uh, adding toilets to uh, all the houses uh, and at the house level itself there are the network of local contractors individual uh, owners can be uh, mobilized uh, for the last uh, type which is the cooperative housing societies uh, it is mostly uh, the condition assessment and scoping repair plan and executing the project that brings me to the intervention strategies uh, that uh, we did in the last year uh, with this understanding of the existing practices and what is what are the existing networks and what are the existing material practices that are uh, ongoing in the old villages at the cluster level uh, there was a requirement to uh, uh, for a soft regulatory landscape uh, of uh, to suggest that how expansions can take place uh, but at the same time ensuring light and ventilation and uh, space to accommodate newer services for future expansions Uh, at the house level uh, there was always a negotiation between uh, light and ventilation versus privacy and uh, the students actually looked at uh, some of the uh, ways in which uh, you can have both and uh, you know designing of uh, those windows facades protection uh, to these windows to avoid uh, dampness and seepage inside the house uh, in case of the old mass housing stock uh, again there was uh, identification of the neglected pockets uh, which were common spaces to strengthen the uh, community infrastructure Uh, and uh, uh, for the problems of light and ventilation uh, we looked at the uh, at small interventions uh, for the unit as well as the overall corridor space of the building because uh, that is where uh, it's a very social space where people generally uh, occupy uh, at the level of the unit uh, there was uh, a proposed uh, extension uh, which uh, is not as ad hoc uh, in the sense that it does not uh, cut out light and ventilation does not create a, create problems for uh the uh, the neighboring units but uh, various ways in which extensions can happen uh, in a consolidated manner for the slums the intervention looked at a kit of parts approach because uh, because uh, it looks at a very uh, 
um, because people make their houses as they get as finance get gets mobilized and as as material is available and it happens over a over a long long period of time and so the uh, the kit of parts actually looked at a, a roof kit because there is a lot of leakage uh, the plinth kit because of the seepage from the ground as well as the facade kit uh, some of the uh, some of the, uh, the the manual of ideas uh, actually uh, involved uh, these drawings which uh, uh, which uh, improved on the practices that that are already going on but that would improve habitability uh, and reduce vulnerability to some extent uh, here is uh, some uh, some exploration on the uh, doors windows openings uh, and how the facade could happen uh, there was also a simulation on uh, on these uh, improved uh, uh, techniques of building and how uh, that affects the light and ventilation inside these houses uh, on the right you see the uh, roof and the plinth uh, details which were also worked out considering the uh, second hand material that is already available within the vicinity uh there was a future imagination of the slums uh, because uh, the the plinth itself uh, actually many things happen at the plinth uh, people occupy the plinth uh, more than they are inside the houses and uh, it it becomes a space to wash utensils wash clothes uh, and also for the children to play so it was uh, articulated in a way that it could add to the community infrastructure in the future it also looked at uh, houses so the current condition of the houses uh, is uh, that all the house that they are densely packed together as a result there is no cross ventilation they cut out light and ventilation so these were uh, uh, approaches on how uh, the houses could be looked at uh, and a cluster of houses could be looked at for the future uh, it is also looking at uh, the fact that it is sitting on a marsh and how uh, the houses could actually uh, be raised uh, to avoid a lot of problems that they face at this point in time in the old cooperative housing societies there was overall repairs and retrofitting uh, which was done uh, and uh, which which was which was the intervention and this year uh, this year we uh, worked on the repair and retrofit module with uh, some of the students uh, which was an extension of this overall study that was done and this year because we were all uh, sort of occupied in our houses we uh, looked at uh, how do we re repair of inhabitation the whole idea of how do you repair inhabitation and uh, the self became the field and uh, these are some of the students works uh, from this year which looked at uh, at uh, a lot of uh, possibilities of intervention uh, bringing the outside in there were uh, there was uh, the chol type where uh, there was a there was a community level infrastructure planning there was the fire escape staircases there were uh, just making it a safe space for everyone to use uh there were also uh, very close uh, readings of lived experiences and of uh, at the scale of the interior and the uh, furniture itself uh, which you also see in um, these interventions so uh, what we are saying is that uh, that that how how can this be done how can this be mobilized how can these processes be uh, put in a framework such that uh, such that we can take place so we're talking of three roles here we're talking of the role of the state Uh, where we are saying that the state's role uh, ne does not need to change much, but uh, it is, uh, but the neighborhood level infrastructure uh, in the specifically in the uh, trolls and uh, in the, sorry, in the villages and the slums can be taken care of and financed by the uh, state, uh, and uh, that can be upgraded. At the house level infrastructure, it is usually it is mostly the individual like it has been going on. It is mostly the individual inhabitants who take care of uh, the house level infrastructure. Uh, the state may provide uh, subsidies. for this or it may uh, create an enabling environment such that uh, these can be mobilized and uh, finally the academy where we are saying that the academy uh, can set up uh, references uh, for contractors uh, on how to build manuals uh, training and skills uh, and increase uh, awareness uh, of of how to build and uh, what it requires is an ecosystem approach and i'm going to uh, hand over to prasad to uh, explain the ecosystem yeah thanks thanks uh, uh, komal so 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 it's very clear to us you know two things are clear to us one is uh, one is you need you need you need a neighborhood level uh, you know improve you know the upgradation and, and infrastructure and stuff like that uh, and that happens particularly in case of slums and in case of old villages 
and that only the state can do and nobody else should try to do also because it requires bulk infrastructure interventions higher capital and stuff like that so that is one part of it and there what we are thinking is you know what we what we need to do is we need to build capacity in 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 developing that neighborhood level infrastructure and 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 that infrastructure requires a different imagination and a different innovation like for example i mean you cannot use the fire tender rules that is applicable elsewhere you know if 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 a fire tender doesn't move through the street then there is no point changing the street you change the fire tender right you know so that's that's really the that's really the key you know how do we innovate the infrastructure and services to kind of you know become part of the fabric and not the reverse you know the 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 infrastructure doesn't drive the fabric wheel really. you know so so that 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 requires detailed thinking and innovative thinking and a, and a, and a very close uh, you know uh, 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 level of uh, intervention the other uh, intervention required is improvement of individual houses you know upgradation repair and retrofit and I, and i think and, and we think now is that you know that that is best left to individual occupants owners renters groups etc 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 and and because because the state will not have and 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 the moment you kind of you know try to regulate it in any ways because the context does not does not is not is not good enough to kind of you know not not not, not relevant i mean the 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 uh the regulatory frameworks may not not be relevant enough for that context you know you cannot put a put a staircase of a standard type or a, or a, or a toilet of a standard type in those uh, fabrics you need to you need to kind of you know figure out new ways of doing it and and that will require individual uh, uh, uh thinking you know at, at 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 a very detailed level and and that already we've seen people are doing it with help of small contractors of course there is there is a lot to be shared and learned and there is where we are saying that you know that sharing and learning and kind of you know uh uh learning from each other that should become the model which one should try to pro- try to promote because because there is nothing we can teach really you know because there is already so much innovation happening and and one is working with also a process which is not so modern you know it is it is not like you make a plan and then you implement it you you write your tenders you write your specification you make a working plan and you and you implement it is that is not the linear process which is followed you know it is somebody is uh, uh, throwing away her uh, cupboard and then a part of it comes and that needs to be fixed and that becomes a part of your house and it opens up another window so there is a lot of there is a lot of you know unclear you know trajectories which 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 become part of your your life and your building process and and these cannot be planned so so you require another you require another completely another think thinking way and for that we think an ecosystem approach is more important where where one is learning by sharing in an enabling environment and i, and I think i think all these actors which are on the on the periphery the slum board the local authority experts local contractors they all exist so we can work with the existing ones what we need to do is get some clarity in the blue uh, uh, you know uh, boxes which is basically you know you need specific kind of strategic interventions and then that that is that that various actors can take up so and then that ecosystem needs to be developed go to the next slide please <laughs> Come on, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and and more important for us was what it what really is a what really is the role of the architectural academy over here, you know? And and architectural academy, I think, and and roller and 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 Komal kind of you know closed it by saying that, you know, how do we kind of you know look at the the question of inhabitation and not necessarily habitation. how do we think of repairing inhabitations and not habitation because it's very clear the home is not the house you know home is many more things you know the street the outside and all of those things and and also within the house the home is home is home is one home happens in a in a very awkward way actually and i think i think architectural school should stick to the question of inhabitation and space and experience and form and i think i think there is there is enough opportunity over there that wh- when one is repairing inhabitation what does it mean so i think i think that is that is the first question the architectural questions in repairing inhabitations the second question is architectural question architectural schools can can provide 
can 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 set up platforms for references and resources and and networking and and sharing and knowledge sharing and 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 do all of those things you know and what does it take really you know developing websites and facebook pages and whatsapp pages and instagram you know pages and and circulating you know all kinds of possibilities of of where contractors and small house key, house owners and everybody can kind of you know uh, uh, share uh, uh, practices and the last thing is of course a little bit of capacity augmentation will be required and and i think i think i think for us it is more important to train every student into repair and retrofit and not only because 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 that is what you know 90% of this country really requires so 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 i think a a, a full scale uh, involvement in uh, training students all students in repair and retrofit and and looking at it more as a design question i think that is what is required along with other capacity building measures thank you we can close here please thank you sad and komal um, rohit shreya vasavita uh, for i think being i mean almost on time um so uh, nikhil uh, if you around we can we can start with the uh, responses and uh, and then follow follow from uh, you know after this discussion i can take some questions from the audience yeah uh, thank you uh to all of you um to colleagues at see um rohit vasrita prasad uh, koma shreya for this wonderful opportunity to think with the uh, amazing work that you're doing um the questions you pose and the work that you're doing are actually i think the questions of our time uh, in no insignificant ways um and you know like together um all of you pose the question and and pose the practice asking how we how we might live on and after the debris of industrial modernity right so debris not just as mine tailings but also the constitutive separations of wet and dry upon which the ideas of property depend or innovation as invention and not a uh, maintenance or the hope that science or planning or secular expertise can be the ground of constituting um equal and just polities right all these ideas in some ways have been undermined uh, no no pun on the word mine uh, in these times um the papers here pay attention to the minor practices um, that are world making right um, and minor here is more a question of value than a question of uh, significance i think right so dust and spirits and salvaging um in vastrick those papers um the ways in which water lines are mediated and remade um in the paper that rohit vasrika um and shreya shared or the extent practices of repair and retrofit that uh, prasad um and komal pointed out um are actually what are the significant forces making a large majority of urban housing today right so together these papers ask how might um the designer or the architect listen here and represent these practices and their practices um and to to like like rethink and reconstitute the field of architecture itself and i'll say more about that in a minute um just a couple of quick um thoughts about each paper before i come back to this larger question um vastikas paper is a, a um i want to be provocative in the sense that it's a, a post humanist reading of landscape um after the enclosures of sarkar and company um in some ways um she points out really well how afforestation as a response to in, the environmental effects of mining uh, is also a practice of enclosure and there's nothing in just or equitable necessarily about this green project that is actually built on the inequities of enclosures of the mine and, and colonial governments in times past right and so in these in these practices of enclosure um what remains or, or what are the fish that take over the woods right and here i think the uh, account of satyadi was actually like really uh, provocative um where she points to the powers of these remains and these remainders um that often times escape um expert reasoning and expert readings but i think the paper points to the importance of of accounting for satyadi's powers and the way in which satyadi is like actually holding both residents and leaders to her account Uh, after the several crises that you described 
um, a question um, in some senses, and, and this is like around the, the idea of the post, right? Uh, and that the post, you know, comes temporarily after perhaps, but does not necessarily imply transition, right? So uh, the colonial forms of rule, for example, that your paper shows really nicely continue in the post-colonial period, right? So, so maybe there's a way to think of the post as a gathering of both colonial and um, modes of reasoning that persist after colonization um, or state control. Um, I was really compelled or, or curious more um, because I didn't hear so much about it, about the work of salvaging um, that you point to as part of the, the um, rest of your presentation, I mean, rest of your work as also as world making, right? And I'll come back to this uh, as well. Thinking in particular about the relationship between salvaging, uh, repair and retrofit. I think that uh, Prasad and Komal talked uh, about um, in, their, in their paper, right? The, the door that can be repurposed. Um, Rohit Vasek and Shriya's work, um, Wetness and the Architectures of Exfoliation are a really compelling, um, it's a really compelling account that urges us to think about the ways in which households that were um, built to escape um, wetness continue to inhabit it. Um, and, in these, and, and this practice actually continues in climate change times. Um, the, the, the three settlements they talk about um, share a common story or a biography of making dry land out of floodplain and the wetnesses that persist and proliferate uh, in the, from the mid 20th century on to this day, um, even as households get reconfigured both relationally with others, but also materially with others uh, in, the, in the contemporary uh, moment. Right, water makes itself known by crossing lines, even as property insists and asserts itself through the creation and proliferation of boundary walls um, becoming vertical and so on. I think the paper is wonderful in in in, uh, in highlighting how the repair practices uh, entail proliferate um, with and perhaps because of the ways in which um, the, the the housing. Um, settlements have developed over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, repair becomes a way not just of holding on to these precarious pieces of land made in floodplain, but also as a way of holding out uh, for redevelopment. And I've, I've shared this with um, uh, with, uh, with uh, Rohit and Vasek and uh, in, in, in times past, with Sri and times past, where I'm really compelled by the idea of thinking of walls as semi-permeable, right? What might it mean to think of a wall not just as a permeable bound, uh, uh, an impermeable boundary, but as something that is regularly crossed, uh, not just by water, but also by people, um, um, relations, and several others, um, also by infrastructure, right? That has have to um, cross these walls. Thinking of water pipes and drainage pipes, for instance, um, and also about what might it might it mean to think about water as not just empty water, but also full of other stuff. Um, this is actually like key to the ways in which um, water is experienced, particularly the monsoons um, in, in these neighborhoods. Finally, um, the, 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 the story refutes the linear telling of housing history. Um, and, and I think this is like wonderfully represented in that slide that had the weave, um, which, which urged attention to the ways in which these various temporalities matter, right? So not just in terms of drying um, from the 1950s, but also um, the changing practices of living with marriages, births and deaths. There's also the time of redevelopment and the time of climate. And this weave actually like calls to mind Tim, Eng Tim Ingold's uh, attention to meshwork, urging attention to the diverse temporalities and the knots which are actually like made as a way of asserting human agency in, these, in, these, you know, um, in this mesh. Right, and the question here is: I ask, um, what um, does a, does the thinking of the weave or the mesh make uh, intervening difficult? So, how does it remake and rethink what intervention can be, um, or does it just tie us up into knots? Right, um, and I'll come back to this again uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Um, Prasad and Kobal like make a very important and persuasive case as to why we might need to think of repair and retrofit as a mode of of housing, <laughs> right, and housing provision. Um, not unlike water supply, I think housing is always presented as a matter of shortage. Um, 
where where where, where um, Prasad laid out how um, 18 million houses are deemed to be in short supply. Um, but in fact, 16 million houses already exist um, and are seen to be insufficient for various kinds of environmental or social conditions, right? Um, and so one of the questions I had is to ask um, or to like, you know, like explain um, a little bit more of what the scarcity talk actually accomplishes, right? So it's not just not knowing that there's enough housing, but not knowing that there's enough housing already produces particular kinds of polities, particular, produces particular uh, regimes of valuing and undervaluing certain kinds of labor, oh, sorry, undervaluing certain kinds of labor and valuing other kinds of labor, right? For example, the developers uh, um, need to be provided incentive because their, their labor is more valued than the work of a contractor, perhaps. So, um, so here, you know, to think a little bit about not only what kinds of labor are valued in this rendition of housing as in, being in scarce supply, but how does then the work of repair and retrofit revalue the work of contractors and maintainers um, and then to also ask, um, what is the place of the architect in the enterprise, which is something I think you'll talk about, you know, in, in year three um, in, in, in this project. So, you know, just taken uh, together and very quickly, repair, retrofit and maintenance here um, are seen to be, uh, are in fact, uh, important sites for recomposing cities, recomposing housing, recomposing the world. Um, and are the sites where a lot of learning and innovation is already happening in the everyday. Um, taking together these papers pioneer a transformative rethinking of what architecture is and what architects might do um, by working not just with the practices and experiences, but also the stories of many people that are involved in these enterprises of repair, maintenance, um, retrofit, um, that are involved in these experiences um, because they are, in fact, what constitute the fabric of cities and landscapes. Um, as Komal uh, points out, we've never actually ever started with a clean, clean slate, right? Um, we, um, but, but what is the recognition that we are never starting with a clean slate actually, clean slate actually accomplishing? Um, because we're always, um, whether we're like anthropologists or architects, um, always starting and intervening from the middle of people's worlds, like like basically like come in their way <laughs> to to sort of ask um, what we might do and how we might think, um, and here maybe like starting from the middle might help us not only rethink the work of of scholars or of architects, but also maybe to ask how might a recognition of this labor of maintaining maintaining repairing and retrofitting not just help us rethink the role of you know pioneers or designers but also as a mode of redistributing resources to work that has long been um, undervalued. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks. Uh, maybe anybody wants to start? Maybe Vastav, if you want to respond to, or do you want to go in the freshness of the question? Prasad, so maybe you can respond first. You can go in the reverse order as well. I can respond to uh, yeah. my sure. Things. Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, so so real estate, of course, is a is one driving uh, you know force uh, in big cities, and and uh, uh, you know uh, one can already see that the real estate that real estate has been the dominant uh, producer of wealth in many cities across India. You know, uh, it's not it's not industry. It's not uh, uh, services, but it's real estate, which has been dominant. Uh, but I think there is also a larger political economy in 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 why uh, house uh, housing shortage is kind of you know uh, rendered uh, as a as a as a uh, as a shortage problem, as a as supply problem. And I think that has to do with uh, uh, one. Of course, uh, we don't know other ways of doing it. In, in in the formal sector uh, so so that's a that's a but more importantly I think there is a uh, there is a uh, you know uh, uh, the, the transactability of property which is so important for 
financial systems to work on one level but on the other level they are so important for old age security for example you know people find house as a very important asset in their lifetime to hinge on to in the in the absence of state provided security so transactable property becomes an important thing which which also drives the need for a a complete house which can be bought and sold and mortgaged and inherited you know the the stock that we are trying to look at is the stock which is not full property you know they cannot be necessarily easily transactable you know so i think i think that political economy also kind of you know uh, uh, plays out in the in the in the in the whole game uh, but i must say in the last 6 years 7 years timeline horizon you know uh, uh, the real estate industry is kind of you know messed up like all other industry in the in the country and uh, it is really a nice time for everybody else to kind of you know uh, you know uh, flourish uh, uh, and 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 at the same i mean it's very clear you know the way uh, uh, even now uh, the, uh, there is a there is a there is a push for self redevelopment in the maharashtra in maharashtra government you know uh, 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 you know discussion so so all kinds of things so i think i think uh real estate is definitely a driving force but i think there is there are many contexts which tie up to kind of you know uh create that that discourse uh on one hand and and how will small contractors displace actually when we go on to the field there is there, there is already so much work happening by small contractors you know 90% of houses are being built by them actually it's not it's not as if they are not being built by them. so we are actually you know in 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 the architects are really in the margins you know uh, but then there is a habitation problem there is a there is a form problem there is a life problem there is there are there are certain things which needs to be kind of you know looked at very closely by architects you know? and i think i think those are questions which are interesting questions for architects to look at not as if you know things will not work without architects things are working fine without architects. so and, and nikhil i think uh, rohit had a little bit of connection issue if you if you want to uh, really pose some question for for the wetness paper uh, nikhil i got your weave and intervention question if there were other questions i missed or comments i missed i i got disconnected so i can i can i can respond to the weave and intervention question in the meantime uh, i i'll kind of speed up i mean that has the thinking around the idea of the weave uh of of uh social and natural history has been very important and the idea of the weave is very important for us because conventionally when you see environmental information systems or when people think of an in information systems per se uh they are thought of in base that are generated by experts and largely often used by experts when there is knowledge that is getting generated by a diverse range of factors there is no one information system that can be produced and that is one of the major points that we want to kind of convey and uh, across it, uh, in fact uh, you need there is a multiple multiplicity of information systems that work at a multiplicity of scales and involve diverse actors and you might one might want to think of you know practices of collaborating with several of these at different scales i mean i'll i'll kind of you know point out a a a a, a few for instance knowledge in 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 the in the in the chawl one of the chawls that uh, uh, houses that was presented in the amongst the three stories the information system through which people come to know about the floods is the storm water drain in front of their house the moment water enters the storm water drain from the river it is time to move up and that becomes a signal Uh, although there is an official siren that goes off when the water levels rise 
in the Daisa River, which comes from the national park. But people don't pay attention to that. What, what people pay attention to is the stormwater drain that, 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 that comes over here. There is, uh, in, in other cases, I mean, uh, Vastavikta and uh, Sharia bought a, uh, mentioned the seasonal economy of contractors, which also kind of, you know, Prasad and Rupali have bought forth in practices of repairing. There's no one contract. The multiple, there are multiple kinds of contractors and these contractors may be people who are kind of doing very small jobs, but somebody who, was, who has the knowledge of, of, of waterproofing. Uh, you know, so there are different kinds of knowledges and architects, uh, I mean, when we kind of open out the idea of exfoliation, we're saying that it is not simply about remedying technological uh, problems or, or technical problems. It's not about the paint on the wall or the repair of the tiles, but it's also about, as you mentioned, walls are permeable to people. Uh, what I want to kind of draw attention to, it is, it, it, is, it, it is the type of habitation that also kind of transforms, which architects could kind of pay attention to and collaborate uh, uh, with these practices in kind of trying to think about ways of making them better. So, so the, the weave of life or, or the weave kind of metaphor is used to open out uh, the idea that there are multiple kinds of information systems, multiple kinds uh, of practices that emerge and those can't be generalized in the context of rising seas. There's no one information system that is going to be uh, addressing the problem. The second thing that I want to kind of point out to that is that there are claims getting produced in multiple ways. In the first part of the presentation, we showed, we showed, uh, we showed images of ways in which some architects are kind of thinking about making polemical arguments. You know? Rising seas is thought of in extreme, extreme ways where water is really going to inundate and create refugees. It is going to create claims in many cases, in many cases, probably like what we witnessed during the partition. And simply by, simply by, uh, you know, uh, by, by uh, finding a new place is not going to be solved in the problem. It's these voices are opening out the claims that they, they are making on space at the present moment. Those, those are going to resonate in extreme cases. Thanks, Roy. Um, I, th I think uh, Nikhil's questions are also revolving around the comments and questions are revolving around those two points, as, as I've uh, noted. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to see that all the three presentations are, in some sense, bring, you know, uh, bringing in that murkiness, the multiplicities of things, um, and really, really, in that sense, you know, disturbing the established landscapes and notions of what architects can and must be uh, in cities in that sense. So um, it's quite interesting to see that. I, I, Nikhil, if, if you want to come back to any of your comments or questions that you think they are, they are not responded, or uh, do you think I should go, I can take some audience questions in the meantime. No, I, I really enjoy the presentations and the response, the, the questions are more like to think about how these are actually, as you point out, uh, presentations that are like tightly woven um, with each other as well in terms of the kind of practices they're urging a, a, a consideration of and a thinking from, you know? So um, this is actually a great, and I think it'd be great to open it up to questions from um, the participants um, at this point. Uh, wondering if I could just respond for a second to like oh, this. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I had a bit of a voice lag, so I'm not sure if I, if I got all of it. Uh, but uh, I think you asked about the idea of enclosures and even about how the afforestation is creating enclosures uh, for the communities and uh, then the lesser uh, dominant actors, if I may say. And, uh, and also you asked about the question of the uh, post uh, and uh, it's, it's not really a, a, a clear division, but it's always uh, seeping in into the next uh, phase. And uh, I, I think, I think, and that is, 
something that has worried me through this research that uh, uh, like a, a lot of the reading that I also did involved uh, reading uh, a lot of documents that were posted by governments and by uh, a lot of agencies that have a lot of uh, a, a large say in these landscapes and uh, what these landscapes start getting post as are post industrial or you know post uh, are degraded wastelands they don't lack uh, the agriculture board talks about the fact that there is no productivity over here uh, and the, the way productivity is defined is very different in all of these uh, definitions and uh, therefore uh, and also through a lot of readings i realized that uh, it seldom occurs that, at least in the Euro-American experience, that you know you you will have a hamlet like Sonchi in this case, uh, which is right in the center of uh, of such large, humongous landscapes where life actually continues and these remnants are still there. These things still seep in, and which is what I think I was trying to uh, get to. I'm not sure if it if it came across, but the fact that it's not linear, the fact that it's not, uh, you know, that clear separation, but there is always going to be something that is going to be left around, which is going to be picked up by, uh, you know, smaller actors. And the whole idea of the storytelling was also giving agency to these actors who, who won't really uh, find their voices over here. And uh, like, it, it's very simple, like right next to Sonshi, there is this uh, town where this, uh, this uh, where there used to be a community, there used to be a hamlet over there. And it's completely restored into this uh, private tourist enclave. And uh, those were their comments and those were taken. Uh, uh, and it's a common practice throughout uh, throughout that, the, the Northern Go Goan mining belt for iron ore at least. And uh, so then what are the other claims that these actors are making? What are the different practices that, you know, are emerging? And can those actually sketch out uh, different futures uh, beyond, you know, just restoration or afforestation? And, also giving agency to you know non-human actors on the site, so uh, it it was a mix of all of that, and which was you know what I tried to do uh, with uh, the the storytelling itself and uh, re the reading of the site, uh, and also the fact that it's not only the architect who's uh, making any ar architecture over here, but there are a lot of other actors who are you know actually shaping the landscape, and uh, then what is our agency beyond you know restoration, and how can we you know come in so. So those were the major questions that I was, you know, wondering. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Vastu. Um, Koman, Shreya, do you guys want to uh, add to add to that, um, or should we move on to the you know, questions from somebody else? Any responses to Nikhil's comment? No, nothing from my side. Thank you. Uh, I think generally Prasad covered uh, the responses, but just to add to the fact that, uh, you know, just to add to the role of the architect, the fact that the architect is, uh, I mean, things things are going on, but but the idea of including repair and retrofit uh, as, as questions of form and space uh, is also to sort of, uh, you know, uh, push future practices to mold uh, themselves uh, along these questions. So I think that's that's where, uh, you know, on the lines of activism and on the line, the lines of, uh, Articulating new questions of, uh, of uh, in the realm of architecture. That's where it comes in. May yeah, uh, if I may just jump in. These presentations like really stimulating, and I think like together, like urging a um, a reconsideration of like practices of like listening and learning. Right. So not just listening to um, contractor, but also listening to the spirit. Right. And and like how might that listening then be then produce a transformative practice. Um, of architecture um, um, with others, right? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very uh, close attention to like doing with others that I think um, ramifies through um, all of your presentations today. Yes. Um, so I think what, what I'll do is I'll just quickly take some of the questions that are there from the audience. Um, in the meanwhile, maybe some of you can also think of responses um, to Nikhil's, uh, Nikhil's comments and questions. Uh, so we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee uh, to Prasad saying, uh, you know, some of the ideas that you are that you're, that you're posing uh, with repair and retrofit are close to uh, Caracas Barrio plan by Josefina Baldo. Uh, so any response? It's not a question, but more like a comment. Do you, do you want to say anything about? Yeah, that? I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The the uh, Caracas Barrio plan uh, 
uh, I think the, it's a 90s uh, uh, development. You know, it's a, in fact, you know, uh, from the mid 80s, uh, uh, the World Bank has been pushing all over uh, the world the idea of upgradation and uh, uh, improvement uh, as a as a strategy to deal with informal settlements, so to say. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the uh, main components of that was to formalize tenure. You know, to kind of you know, so that was the that was the basic thing, and then, and and one of the thinking at that time was if you formalize tenure, then people will invest more in their land, uh, in their property, and then it will everything will be fine. Uh, in in India also in some places this was done, but but the results are not very clear, and 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 you know, uh, you uh, people never in people did stop investing in non-formal land, non-formal tenure, as well as you know, there was not substantial difference. Uh, Josephina's Baldo's book actually is quite interesting because it covers that that whole experience of uh, 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 the Barrio plan. I think I think I want, want to make one distinction here. You know, the uh, the the cultural landscape between South American cities and Indian cities. You know, and I think I think uh, one has to kind of also look at uh, the role of the universities. The role of the uh, left politics groups, uh, the low role of the uh, uh, CBOs, uh, you know, uh, in comparison in both both contexts. And I think I think uh, uh, where one sees the role of the universities kind of you know consolidating the role of the left uh, groups consolidating the role of the uh, grassroots, uh, uh, you know, CBO organizations consolidating uh, in 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 South American cities. In Indian context, it's slightly it has been it has been it has been slightly different. It has been different in a very different. It, it's like like the left doesn't exist anymore, you know, in in Indian context. In, in particular, in the large cities, it doesn't exist. Uh, particularly in the politics political realm, the university doesn't participate even if it exists it doesn't participate fate in the everyday politics uh, forget uh, uh, you know it participates in a larger context in some cases but but otherwise it doesn't participate uh, the cbos and the ngos are largely hijacked by uh, the uh, uh, i mean today we, we, you don't know you know uh, uh, you, w whether one is working for a corporate or for an ngo because because all uh, uh, you know, uh, terms of references are similar. So, so I think, I think, I think one has to kind of you know make those cultural differences. And uh, what what we are kind of you know we we I mean this is this is a very important reference for us. This has been I mean uh, uh, the Caracas plan has been a very important reference for everybody who's working in the in, in in upgradation. But what is what is important for us is kind of you know figure out a way in which you tactically you know, work with the existing systems and articulate a role for yourself, which is probably relevant, test it and then move on. I think that has been our, our internal uh, uh, way of going about things. Yeah. Thanks, Prasad. I think the next question is, is interesting, probably for all panelists uh, here, and I invite everyone, and including Nikhil, to maybe respond to this but could be an, uh, an interesting, um, you know, uh, entry point for a lot of architects to clarify the question around research. So Isaac Matthew is asking, how does one distinguish between planning research, conservation research, and architectural research? How does one know uh, which domain new knowledge is added to as a result of the work done? Or for that matter, the findings are in fact new knowledge and not just another representation. And just before I, I invite everybody to respond. I think, um, you know, Nikhil is an anthropologist and uh, historically they're famous for blurring boundaries. Uh, so so maybe, may, may I invite first Nikhil to maybe respond to that question and then open up to Rohit and to start formal class of explanation. Um, sure. Um, yeah, actually that's kind of a strange thing to the question. I think that's kind of why the, the question I would ask is why must one distinguish between planning research, conservation research and architectural research, right? Or to put it differently, this precisely in crossing, not just across different domains of planning, conservation and architecture, but also 
let's say, the social sciences and the natural sciences. Uh, but also, as, as I think um, Vasa Ritap did to great effect, uh, the humanities as well, right? Um, which is to say, um, how might recompositions of different bodies of knowledge and different bodies of knowers actually give us a new perspective from which to rethink the world, right? So, so for me, I'm not as interested in maintaining the boundaries of these research bodies as I am, you know, the second part of that question is, is a good one. Like, how can these then recompositions add and make us rethink say architectural practice or architectural research or, or anthropological research for that matter? Um, but I think that's actually like an important question, right? And I think, I think that the three papers today by, by attending to practices of, of, of storytelling, of, of repairing and of thinking um, from wetness um, do give us tools to like rethink um, not just architectural practice, but also planning practice, right? Um, yeah. So, so my, my, my answer would be like that these presentations um, actually make critical interventions um, in their bodies of expertise precisely by borrowing from different traditions and also like different um, interlocutors um, with which to like rethink the world with. Uh, just to kind of you know uh, because I, I mentioned you know uh, uh, figure out architectural questions I think I need to kind of you know clarify what what it is because I, I feel I feel uh, it, particularly in in in, uh, in Indian uh, and I've said this before at several places I've written about it you know uh, in India the the uh, architectural questions are uh, uh, are not articulated so precisely, yeah. and and I'm referring specifically to the question of form and space with reference to the realm of meaning and experience. You know, so 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 I think I think these these questions are not articulated very specifically and precisely. And I think I think those are those are important uh, uh, questions for uh, architects to. To kind of you know well and 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 uh, because 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 in India uh, architects don't know whether they are botanists, they are physicists, they are you know engineers, they are kind of you know uh, community activists or what are they doing really? You know they do all of this which is very nice. I also have done it and everybody has, all of us have done it. You know all the time we do it. But the, I think but I think I think for for the discipline of architecture some some uh, 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 precision will be required and some organized thought will be required and i think i think it has to emerge you know and i think therefore and that has to go in the realm of common space and experience and meaning actually rohit i know you've been you've been uh, a proponent of uh, you know kind of mixing you know, uh, what was inquiries from various disciplines and kind of you know, disturbing the landscapes of architecture. So I think maybe your response would might help to add to this question. Well, I think Nikhil and Prasad covered it all. I and mean, I'll just give an anecdote about what ha a discussion that happened. You know, uh, I was walking in a city along with uh, a teacher of mine after a lecture where a similar question kind of opened. And we were walking through this street in a particular city. And um, I asked him to respond to that question in that conversation. And he said, why are you worried about it? Leave it to the library. Don't worry. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was a nice way of thinking. And I mean, I'll tell you what the context was. I mean, questions about anything I mean, about any aspect can come from any kind of what he was trying to tell me or what his kind of message that I got from him was questions about anything can come from any kind of discipline. Okay. So, uh, so it doesn't have to be any particular discipline. Uh, so I, 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 I would, I would leave it open for all kinds of discipline to ask any kind of question. There is no, there's no boundary. In fact, uh, the questioning is what kind of makes and changes disciplines. Anyone else? Vastavita, Shreya, Kumar? I think uh, the response is quite sharp. Uh, if not, then I'll move to the next.
question slash comment by um, Shantanu Kantra. He's asking to take what Prasad uh, is saying further when he says that individual houses uh, should be should be the individual houses should be to take the responsibilities of the sorry should be the responsibility of the individual resident or family and the state should handle the larger issues like infrastructure can we also think about strengthening the different levels of administration such as neighborhood committees or as we go further up the, up the scale in other words even ideas of planning which are extremely top down to be turned on their head by coming from the bottom up and situate larger interventions among smaller aspirations rather than the other way around yeah i mean yes uh, uh, you need you need you need you need many levels of networks you know uh, uh, the slum sanitation program which happened between 2000 and 2005 or so uh, you know promoted the idea of a uh, of a local level a uh, group which would then you know take up sanitation and then run a public toilet and stuff like that and uh, in 10 years time we saw the collapse because it it developed its own politics and it kind of you know had its own kind of nuance and once the asset was kind of you know uh, removed then there was no there was no context for such uh, such uh, uh, things to play you know you know my my example for this is the ganeshotsav mandal actually you know it's it's very nice you know and it's it and 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 it's it's kind of interesting to kind of you know look at it very carefully because it is completely crowdsourced organized and networked completely in a in a in a very messy way comes together comes together in large numbers you know there are one lakh pandals in bombay and it promises to come every year and year, a year after year and it kind of you know gets whole whole series of you know finances capital state everybody kind of you know mobilized you know and and how does it happen it's 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 a it's an interesting case study to look at you know and and but but the thing is it happens and it disappears you know we are a, we are a, we are a nation of uh, marriages you know in during even time uh, people come together form and then, then they kind of disappear and then that happens throughout in all urban experiences also you know but 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 the promise of it coming every year is it will be will be very important to kind of you know uh, recognize and 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 take note of i'm not i'm not interested in top down or bottom up thing but i'm saying that you know figure out a way in which tactically you can kind of you know do things where if you need top down you use top down and if you need bottom up you use bottom up do whatever but kind of you know keep keep the focus of improving and upgrading uh, you know habitation and and in habitation uh i think isaac's next question is sort of covered in in, in the in several responses that we got earlier but just maybe kind of what is asking is do we need a indian version of wabi sabi uh, or do we need another framework i think the presentation in some sense offered that framework to the so I, I you know you know when you know a lot of people compared raj kapoor and later jagdeep to charlie chaplin you know and and it was unfair to raj kapoor jagdeep as well as charlie chaplin you know you cannot you should not be doing that you know it's kind of you know uh, uh, one is a useful reference and and how does one kind of you know and i also mentioned scarpa there and then there are plenty of other other examples to kind of you know look from and learn from there are there are whole series of indian practices that are that exist over here uh, which are which are culturally kind of you know a developed so i think i think i think as references they 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 are very very useful there is no version there is no indian version or a local version of wabi sabi or something like that uh, the last question by soham mehta uh, asking again to prasad uh, as prasad mentions the role of the architect is very marginalized in, in today's society especially when it comes to building as small uh, contractors have taken over this and mass um, we also talked about the uh, disappearance of the left in indian politics these days how do you see the role of architect changing in the future could the architect take on the issues caused by political and policy polarization or take on another role well i mean 
uh, uh, to begin answering this question, you need to understand what does the architect do. And the problem with Indian uh, uh, Indian uh, discourse has been that you know uh, it has been very unclear what does the architect really do. You know, uh, it has been articulated as 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 largely being a part of the building industry. And I think I think the architect's role and thinking and thought and as a as a as a craftsperson of space and form. Uh, to kind of you know shape the idea of life, I think those those dimensions need to be thought of before coming to be before being enthusiastic about participating in 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 politics of all kinds. You know, you need to know you need to articulate your 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 terrain and your positions, etc., etc., etc. But I but I agree with it. You know, you you need to kind of you know figure out those things. But but more importantly. Uh, there and, and I think tomorrow's presentations will speak about that in terms of articulating how does one take, pick up architectural questions in India, you know, and where does where does one look for? Where, how does one kind of you know go about you know methodologically articulating them? You know, I think I think tomorrow's we we, we have some work at see on that as well. Yeah, I think Nikhil just posed a chat uh, comment. I think it's very quite. I mean, Relevant here to think about how large events like Kumbh Mela are also organized in a very temporal, you know, basis. And uh, Rahul Mehrotra has, you know, put together a fantastic study a book uh, with a team from, you know, uh, Harvard GSD. Uh, so worth a, worth a read for everybody who might be interested in such issues, which work at large scale. Um, so these are the questions so far that we have from. The audience. I mean, any any uh, thoughts, uh, closing remarks? Uh, Nikhil, sorry to put you on spot again, but if you have any uh, closing thoughts, Rohit, Vastu, uh, Komal, Shreya. I think I would just like thinking with that last question. Um, you know, the the the. Um, the role of, of architects um, in society in some senses is a, um, has been changing over time. And I think one of the weird things um, that Prasad is gesturing to about the role of architects in India, wedded as they have been, or imaginatively at least, to the real estate industry, um, is being unpacked and unbundled, perhaps in part because of the crises that we were talking about earlier. Um, but, but perhaps for other reasons as well. And uh, it's a good time to like, um, and I think all of these papers today have been such wonderful uh, expositions of not only like what it can be otherwise, but also what architects can do otherwise, right? Um, so thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed thinking with you all. Thanks, Nikhil. Um, anyone else? Rohit, any closing remarks or questions? For the panelists and for the audience, Komal. No, okay. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Nikhil, and uh, thanks everyone, Prasad, Vastavika, Rohit, Komal, Shreya, uh, for you know, taking out time and, and putting your presentations forward for the audience. I think it was really wonderful to see all these work, this work, come together. Like Nikhil mentioned. They kind of seem to be fitting really well with one another, you know, asking really interesting questions that uh, that, that can, you know, that that have answers uh, or rather a larger field of inquiries, you know, ranging from vast uh, fields of uh, post mining landscapes to like neighborhoods in a suburban uh, location in, 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 in a city like Bombay, uh, kind of, you know, really problematizing particularly what the last question was asked by Soham, what should architects do in situations like that? Should architects do anything in situations like that? Um, and maybe just for, for just a parting uh, note, perhaps what is important also is that the question that you're asking, uh, in some sense, you find you've formed an interesting bond with it. So follow through it. Uh, that's probably a more interesting role to take rather than you know, to, to kind of uh, struggle whether we, we should take one position versus another position. So with that, I'll, I would like to probably end uh, today's wonderful session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks uh, to all the audience who also kind of patiently waited for all the presentations. 
we will have another round of presentations two presentations tomorrow uh, sorry three more presentations tomorrow um the three presentations will be around uh, the emerging context for housing in india which kind of builds upon uh, the studies um, on second cities in india together done by prasad rohit myself and uh, anushka sadatpuri uh, and we'll have uh, a presentation by um ipshita karmakar rupali gupta and anuj on uh, architecture of nepal uh, which 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 falls under the south asian architecture and urbanism cluster and the last presentation by dushyant and uh, megha megha uh, who will be who will be presenting their work on uh, emerging materialities in architecture so see you all tomorrow thank you once again and thanks for your patience and time thanks bye 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 thanks nikhil thanks nikhil thanks to you thanks nikhil thanks everybody thank you and yeah i really enjoyed this thank you everyone